The, this panel is going to be tracking pediatric neurological disorders, autism, and brain damage using cell therapies. And uh, uh, these are the three speakers, and I think you're going to find this uh, quite illuminating, even if, even if you're not a pediatrician or, or involved in, in pediatric brain diseases. Um, in fact, I'm going to... I'm going to start off, my name's Evan Snyder, and I'm going to uh, not just talk about data, I'm actually going to give a more uh, philosophical view of where I think the stem cell field is now, and more importantly, where I think it's going to be going over the next 10 to, to 20 years. And I'll use pediatric diseases, brain diseases as an example, but I think you're going to see that, I, I, hopefully you'll take away that this is also where I think the field is going, not just for the nervous system, but for, for other, organ, uh, other organ systems. The reason why I'm pleased that, it's, uh, that we're going to be doing the pediatric brain, however, is that uh, I'm a bit of, a, of a, both a pediatric and a neuroscience chauvinist, and, and I think that it was looking at what goes on in the developing brain that helped launch, and the brain in general, which was thought to be rigid, and the pediatric brain, which is development, that helped launch the field of regenerative medicine. And I say that because this was the view that we all had of the nervous system, probably for the first hundred years of neuroscience. And it was very deterministic and rigid. Everybody knew that regenerative, that re, that, uh, regenerative organs like the blood, the skin, the gut, the liver, all had stem cells, but the very fact that a, an organ that was thought to be immutable could harbor, harbor cells that had this kind of capacity all throughout life and definitely beyond the window of development, in my view, is what gave rise to regenerative medicine because all of a sudden one thought about not just you know, waiting for things to restore themselves, but you actively harnessing this biology and restoring. But, I think it's important to realize, and this is where the pediatric brain is particularly informative in this regard, is that stem cells are just parts of intrinsic developmental programs. And what their job is, is to part, put the brain together, put the nervous system together, organogenesis, and then, and then to maintain homeostasis throughout life. That's their biologic imperative. And if we want to harness that biology, then we have to be consistent with that imperative. We can't go against what their biologic language is, what their intrinsic programs, and what their intrinsic intent is. So I'll use the neural stem cell as an example. The reason the pediatric brain is so appealing is because this is the beginning of development. This is where these programs play themselves out from the very beginning. And I'm going to make the argument that no matter how you get to the neural stem cell, whether it's through IPS cells or ES cells or from the fetus or even from the adult, we need to know, understand what these guys are doing to be able to then harness it for, for therapeutic purposes. Which means that their job is not just to make neurons, but to make the entire milieu, to make oligodendrocytes, to make astrocytes, to that work in a coordinated fashion and to restore that. It also means that when one does a transplant, if, if you're a transplanter, and put a stem cell into a, a pathologic environment, there's a dynamic. Both elements change. The host changes and the cell changes, and they change in response to these arrows. We need to understand each one of these arrows to use this intelligently. So. I'm going to run this list for over my 15 minutes. I'm going to do it very quickly. I'm going to run my list of where I think this field is going. Now, notice that, and I'm going to start from what I think is most near term to what is harder. It's the inverse order, A, of how I got involved in this and the way most of us think about it. But I think I've been doing this a really, really long time now, and I think the experience has taught us that even though we all started here and we'll still get there, this is going to take a lot of intellectual heavy lifting. But in the course of getting there, we've actually learned a lot of other things that are a bit near term. And I'm going to take each one of these and give you examples of where I think the field is going. Now, interestingly, I think predicting 
And getting in early before there's damage is probably where the field needs to go, particularly with kids, which means personalized medicine. It means being able to get a database and understand the risks and then tailor the therapy for each individual. Now everybody recognizes that, but nobody really knows yet how do we actually get there. And I'm not saying that I have the answer to that, but I'm a neonatologist in addition to being a neurologist. And in my own small way, I, I like to think that I'm starting to get together a database. This part of the cord is chucked away of every newborn, and this is right out of the starting gate. However, we can take that tissue that normally is biologic waste, turn them into iPS cells, which of course give rise to all cell types, but importantly, give rise to neurons. Now, the value of a database like this is not just having iPS cells, it's being able to constantly not only do omics, in other words, the genome and the, and the proteome, but also what I like to call the phenome, in other words, the functional readout, get this and constantly correlate that with how these kids do. So I have IRB approval at UCSD to do this for the first 100 babies born at UCSD get their omics, including their functional, and constantly correlate what goes on with these kids for the next four years of their life. Who develops autism? Who develops a brain tumor? Who develops diabetes or a heart disease or penicillin allergy or something like that? And hopefully then we will come up with biomarkers so that we can anticipate a problem and intervene early. So what this of course means is modeling diseases in a dish. Now this is, it's not a new concept, but it's gotten a lot, a, a real kick with the advent of the IPS field. What it means is taking normal cells and assaulting them in ways that you think a disease unfolds itself, or now taking cells from a patient who has a disease and believe that now this cell, it contains the elements of that disease. So one can study pathways, drug targets, the drugs against those targets, the mechanism of action, and, and, and things of that sort. Importantly, prognostics. So first you have to know, do you know the right cell to profile? And initially, you know, everybody said, well, just do neurons, you, neurologic disease, do neurons. Well, what we've kind of learned is that if you start looking at models of the epiblast, and ES cells do that, is that's not what happens. The normal body plan is multiple germ layers and multiple lineages completely coordinated with each other. And here's just an example of early neurectoderm and early vascular precursors completely pattern each other and they co-coordinate. And in fact, it's the neural crest that leads the way, creates the neurovascular pattern, through these kind of signals that we've studied. And if you get rid of either one of those, the entire system, both systems recede and, and you fail in development. So even though everybody wants to do pure populations, that may not really be what teaches you about development and certainly not about disease. We kind of learned this, uh, again, through an error that turned out to be quite informative when we wanted to treat ALS. When we started this more than a decade ago, the idea was, well, let's just, let's just replace motor neurons. But the sophistication about the disease and our sophistication about uh, the stem cell grew. And even though when we started transplanting stem cells into this SOD1 model of ALS, thinking we were going to replace motor neurons, we got great survival, the largest survival ever reported in, in this animal, more than a year and a half. But it wasn't because we were replacing motor neurons. We were doing many things, but importantly, we thought we were going to try to replace motor neurons. What we wound up replacing mostly was uh, the, the astrocytes, which we learn now are toxic in this disease to the motor neurons. So we were able to inhibit the animal's own neural stem cells from cranking out these toxic astrocytes, inhibit that, let our neural stem cells crank out gentler, kindler uh, astrocytes, and then also gray matter oligodendrocytes, all of which preserved the animal's own motor neurons, particularly in areas that subserved survival, the respiratory center being able to groom, 
and maintain, maintain function. What's the right profile? I mean, what do you want to profile once you actually have these? Well, we're starting to learn a lot about that, too. We're starting to learn, for example, that the transcriptome is not informative enough, not even the epigenome. The proteome is getting closer because that is what dictates how a cell behaves. But we're becoming more and more sophisticated in terms of going up to the metabolome, the connectome, and now starting to look at organoids. Now, Ilya Singetch in the lab kind of got onto this kind of early. He was starting to make, mimic neural tube closure and kind of almost make little mini neural tubes in a dish that he could then study in terms of disease. Lena uh, Mastroangelo is looking at migrational defects. So she's starting to make iPS cells from diseases like kids who have lysencephaly versus unaffected kids, put them in cerebroids. And it's kind of interesting. We don't have a lot of data on this other than here, in making these cerebroids, one can start seeing normal folding and kind of interesting patterns, all of which are missing in these cerebroids of kids that go by the real name of smooth brain. That's what lysencephaly is, and it's an, a, a migrational defect. So can we uh, assay a, a, a meaningful predictor? Well. We're getting really good at making iPS cells from monogenic diseases where we know the pathway, we know the cell type, uh, we know the proteins. But the real challenge is going to be these complex polygenic multifactorial diseases of which most neurologic diseases are poster children. Certainly autism and, and neurodevelopmental disorders and neuropsychiatric disorders are poster children for that. But not only are these diseases important in and of themselves, but if we can tackle these, we may be able to get insight into how to do better disease modeling for these complex diseases. So I won't, we've come up with something we like to call the molecular can opener strategy. The can, the can contains these very complex polygenic multifactorial diseases. And the notion is to find a molecular handle to pry into that. Now, bipolar disease is unique in that for completely unknown reasons, these patients respond to lithium, though nobody really knows the target in this disease. Why does it work? Well, we started prying into the can. We found, in fact, the target of lithium. And once we had that node, we could, we could map upstream and downstream and, in fact, find that it's a pathway that modifies cytoskeletal elements. Well, this is a developmental pathway which starts reinforcing, and this is why it's pertinent to a pediatric meeting, because it starts reinforcing what people have suspected, that these neuropsychiatric disorders are developmental disorders. This pathway where CRIMP2 is, is kind of the lead node is important for making uh, neuroid outgrowth, connections, and networks, and the set point is just too high in that it gets inactivated in these bipolar patients so that they release cytoskeletal elements. And in fact, what happens, if you knock that out, you get completely aberrant dendritogenesis. You get a diminished spine density. And if one starts looking, these are in the animals now, if you start looking at how this kind of molecule is regulated, when it's active, in other words, not phosphorylated, it's in the spines. When it becomes inactive, it leaves the spines. And you can imagine if it's inappropriately, excessively inactivated, you get very poor spine function, which means very poor network function. Now, that's in the animals. But when we actually go to the human patients, to brain banks, we find, in fact, too, active, too, too much inactive CRIMP2. And in fact, the dendritic spines are just like in the humans, just like you see in the animals and uh, compared to, to normals. And both in the patients as well as in the iPS cells get normalized in response to lithium. This gets to another theme that I want to bring out. We're starting to realize that these diseases, even though they might be triggered by cell death, probably are network problems. These are network opathies. And that's what we have to start looking. The networks get screwed up by many reasons. Cell death obviously is a major source of it, but there are others. But once we know this, the next step is, can you prevent them? 
So one way of preventing them, of, uh, of course, is finding a target and screening drugs that change your target in a meaningful way, doing an assay. So in the case that I just told you, what we would want to do is find something that normalizes this inactive crimp. And ideally, it would be an FDA-approved drug that simply gets repurposed. Well, Cameron Pernia in the lab is starting to look at FDA-approved drugs, and he's found some that do exactly what lithium does in normalizing the level of, of CRIMP2. Not that we would necessarily want to use the drugs he's finding, but it means that you can find alternative drugs. Predicting also means getting in and treating early. So by treating early, I mean really treating early, going in during while the brain is being formed, because maybe once the baby's born, that, that might actually be too late. But what it, and the notion that one can do this comes from some of this work where we would take human neural stem cells. This is a, a, a fetal monkey. This is an ultrasound. That's the baby's head. You put it into the ventricles, which are lined by the ventricular zone, which gives rise to the cerebrum during development. And what, what we're able to find and what you can see is that your donor cells, and imagine them now as being normal wild-type cells, integrate with the patient's own cells, which may bear a disease. You're not curing the disease so much as you're kind of diluting the effect. And not only with new neurons that are intermixed with the disease cells, but even laying the seed for new neural stem cells that throughout life may be able to populate the brain. So diluting out the disease, maybe turning a bad disease into a milder disease. What about trying to really preemptively look at a disease? Well, we think that neural stem cells are what give rise to brain tumors. And this is obviously in a mouse. The neural stem cells over here in this particular mouse model, this is a mouse who's fated to get a glioblastoma. He will. But what we found is the reason it happens is that the neural stem cells that normally should be going out here and becoming neurons are not. The signal is inappropriate. They don't go out there. There's impaired neurogenesis. And in fact, there's too much gliogenesis. They go up here and make a tumor. However, because we know the Achilles heel there, you can take a drug and prevent the tumor from being formed so that now the tumor either recedes or never forms and you get normal neurogenesis. So that maybe the notion of preemptively treating a patient before in the pre-malignant or pre-morbid state would be good. Now the extreme of this, of course, and this is exceedingly controversial, but it is starting to characterize the stem cell field is how early can you go? Can you go pre-implantation? Now, so we're talking about doing genome editing right out here just prior to pre-implantation. And as you go further and further and further back, it becomes exceedingly controversial because now you're changing the germline. This will be in the future discussing about this. But if you can predict and you can't protect, uh, you can't prevent, maybe you can at least protect. And this notion of protecting, again, like most things in my lab, it seems, was a mistake. We were trying to replace cells, but in fact, we got recovery of function because we preserved cells. We preserved the, in, the host cells from dying, and it became something that we called the chaperone effect. We've seen it in spinal cord injury. We've seen it in Parkinson's disease, where the nigrostriatal pathway has been preserved. And in fact, Dustin Wakeman, who's receiving an award for the work that, that's represented here in um, is, uh, uh, was pivotal in showing a lot of the mechanism behind this. Now, how does this emerge? Well, what happens is if you, and this is a pediatric disease, so it's very informative. If you take the stem cells and you put it, let's say, in a region, and they'll actually migrate there, a region of perinatal asphyxia, you will get neurons, and that's what we're going for. Neurons that, in fact, will send processes across the uh, corpus callosum to tar appropriate targets. But we actually also saw oligodendrocytes, and we saw new astrocytes, and in fact, a minority of neurons and other cell types. It's as if the stem cell knew that it needed to reconstitute the milieu in exactly the right ratio, and neurons are a minority ratio. So I often say that even the dumbest stem cell is smarter than the smartest neuroscientist. It knew that what it needed to do was to reconstitute this milieu, and it does it through crosstalk, a division of labor. 
This cell becomes one type, this cell becomes another. For example, an, uh, an astrocyte that then feeds back onto the host and gives rise to protective molecules, anti-inflammatory molecules, changing the milieu, anti-scarring, mobilizing endogenous neural stem cells that send neurite outgrowth, causing vascularization from host vascular, uh, vascular precursors, which means many cell types are going to be needed doing many different kinds of mechanisms, which drives companies and regulatory agencies nuts. But if you attack just one aspect of a disease, it's, it's not going to get done. It does it through diffusible factors, but we're also starting to learn also through cell-cell contact. For example, in this particular case, this is a Purkinje cell degenerative disease. The stem cells are in green. These guys are alive, not because these guys became Purkinje neurons, but they are making cell-cell contact through gap junctions and changing the internal metabolic state of these cells that otherwise would die. And it, we don't know how it's happening, but it happens across many different pediatric neurologic diseases. Here's spinal cerebellar atrophy type 1. These Purkinje cells are decorated with all these gap junctions from these green neural stem cells that are now allowing these cells to, to survive. And budding off exosomes, little you know, extravagances from the cells, and changing host cells is, is a whole new area of understanding the, 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 this chaperone effect. What about restoring? Well, restoring can be thought of in many ways. And when we saw that the blue stem cells distributed themselves throughout the brain and integrated seamlessly, and we saw that we could see them because they were expressing LAC-Z, a transgene, just a reporter gene, but you can imagine if it was making something that was bioactive, bringing it in in a Trojan horse fashion, you could restore function, and you could restore function to kids that are missing a metabolic enzyme, a lysosomal enzyme, just by giving a slightly bit of this enzyme, only 2% of normal or less, restores normal metabolism. And in fact, this use in a pediatric disease that I think we pediatricians are quite proud of was the very first use therapeutically of a solid organ stem cell in any organ system. And it was in a kid's lysosomal storage disease, as you can see here, and replicated now by many others, including now going into clinical trials. So the cells are making, or you're taking advantage of what the cells intrinsically make, now, of course, you can goose that up. You can engineer these guys to make other things that, that, that you want. Now, you can also, uh, it's interesting. I, I, I was downplaying what the cells, how the cells respond to their environment, but there are certain cases where it is useful in terms of restoring. In these same lysosomal storage diseases where this enzyme is missing, an alternative metabolite can be made which is toxic to the, to the patient's own cells. For unclear reasons, um, the stem cell, maybe because it grows up in this environment, seems to be kind of resistant to this alternative toxic metabolite. And we, in looking at mouse models of crab A's disease, we found unexpectedly, and, and Joanna will talk about this disease in greater detail, but it's oligodendrocytes fail to myelinate because of a toxic milieu and missing an enzyme, we can now get repopulation of the oligodendrocyte uh, compartment from the stem cells, making pretty good myelin. So that is one aspect where it's, a, it's not a neuron replacement, but it is an oligodendrocyte replacement that restores function in that regard. We also recognize that these cells could be armed not only with things that are good, but also things that are nasty. And then you would want something delivered nasty to a brain tumor. And Karen Abudi, when she was a postdoc in the lab, and I explored this, and now arming these cells for recurrent glioblastoma, using the cells to deliver things, and it is now in clinical trials out at City of Hope. So the, when we talk about restoring, however, most people don't think about restoring the way I was talking about it in, in metabolic diseases. Most of the time they talk about restoring function to patients that have been in wheelchairs for years. Now, this 
is the field's biggest challenge. This is regenerative medicine's third rail because we don't really know how to do it. We avoid it. All the papers that anybody's ever read where a stem cell has done anything useful, and that's not just in the nervous system and it's not just in kids or adults, it's in any organ system, it has been acute and subacute because this is a challenge. Now one way to think about it is, well, maybe what we can simply do um, is just fool the system into thinking that it's been recently injured or that it's actively early degeneration. So create the subacute milieu in the chronic milieu. And so we've characterized what goes on subacutely. Maybe what we can do is now, it's not changing. Am I, is something wrong? Oh, there it goes. OK. Whoop. <laughs> anyway, I, wa I don't know how to go backwards. Anyway, it was taking the molecules that were in the subacute milieu and just re-expressing them in the acute milieu. And, and, and we're able to do that. But chronic injury has, is a completely different paradigm. It's not simply doing what you did in the acute environment, but just doing more of it, higher dose, more rapidly for longer. Whole things change where we need new paradigms. There's vascular reorganization and neural reorganization and cortical reorganization. There's muscle atrophy. There's scarring. There's encephalus seals. So we need a completely different paradigm to be able to do that. And this, of course, probably is going to require combined products and multimodal approaches to be able to do that. So we're, Ted Tang and I are taking a clue from what worked in the acute spinal cord injury, but it was a way of, getting, of doing end rounds and alternative routes to the muscle, and that's combining stem cells with biodegradable scaffolds, so a tissue engineering solution. And what one is able to do is create different ways of circumventing the obstacles in the spinal cord. What's also kind of interesting is that from this, one starts sending down fibers that engage these kind of intraspinal motor programs. These do not require uh, uh, higher center regulation. Every baby can step. They step not because of supraspinal control, but because they have these internal motor programs. And then they recede because they're superseded by supraspinal control. Well, they can be re-engaged. And it looks like this mechanism is re-engaging them, so it's an alternative route to the muscle. It also makes us realize that we don't need to have long projections. If we just get additional segments of function, that is a win. Uh, restoring function, like say in spinal cord, one or two segments of function gives you respiratory control, it gives you bowel and bladder control, it allows you to use your thumbs. The same approach we think might be able to be used in the brain. This is an acute asphyxial injury, but again, stem cells on a scaffold are be able to make new parenchyma. It's ugly, it's not pretty at all, but what it's able to do is inhibit scarring and allow fibers to go through what formerly was a no man's land. And maybe we can start trying to play a tissue engineering approach even in the brain. Again, because we think these, how complex the creation of networks are, and because we think many of these diseases are network problems, still the low hanging fruit is going to be preserving these very complex networks. And I'm going to end here by talking about replacing. This obviously is the holy grail of the stem cell field. That's why we all got into it. That's why I got into it. But that's going to be hard for all kinds of reasons. First, we don't know enough about development, and we recognize now we really do need to recreate development. Trying to let the environment instruct the stem cell and, and not know anything gets us there about 50% of the way, but we need to go further. Also, the cells that come out of stem cells are immature. They need to be matured in exactly the right way. And we're probably going to need a real orchestra talking to each other. So this notion that we didn't need to know anything, I take blame for. Jeff Macklis and I, back in the early 90s, found that even in the adult cortex, in this little area that's non-neurogenic, in this little area, if we created 
artificially an area of apoptosis, and we took undifferentiated neural stem cells and we put it in that area, there they became pyramidal neurons. Though outside of that area, they did what they're supposed to do, just become glial cells. So we thought that, well, we don't need to know anything. You know, the, these guys talk to each other and we're, we're just, you know, we, we just take the credit. That's not good enough. The stem cells, when they come out of a pluripotent state, actually want to become forebrain. That's illustrated over here, dorsal cortical forebrain. If we want them to do other things, and they need to do other things, they need to find the precise targets. For example, if you want dopaminergic neurons, you gotta go through the intellectual heavy lifting of recapitulating development. You gotta tell them that they're in the midbrain. You gotta tell them through sonic hedgehog that they're ventral. You have to tell them that they're meant to be A9 dopaminergic neurons by creating floor plate. So, I'm gonna end here by saying that I think that these are the actions that I think stem cells can play in neurologic disease, both definitely in the pediatric group, but also in the adult group. And this is playing into their intrinsic uh, biologic properties. I think we'll get to cell replacement, but that's gonna take a lot of heavy lifting. I think this other stuff is gonna be more near term. What are the best cells to use? I'm not even gonna get into that. I think Joanne will use, in the meetings that she and I attend, this makes for absolute Talmudic debate. So I'm not even gonna to touch it. Joanne, be my guest. <laughs> but we all wanna make kids better. This is a letter that I got, and this is gonna lead in uh, to, to, to Davis's talk as a patient advocate. Here's a letter that I get that says, Dr. Snyder, please make me better. And this is what we want to do. That's, that's why we do this job. We want to be able to get to here, and we're going to get there. But again, I'm still going to say that the biggest obstacle is not politics. Um, it's not funding. It's actually still the biology. We kind of, these are the biological obstacles that we're starting to encounter. But the biggest biological obstacle of all is for most pediatric diseases, we really don't need, know what needs fixing. Even when we think we know what needs fixing, it's usually wrong. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Davis, and so my talk's called Bridging Gaps, and it's just a brief presentation on improving the unity between families, patients, patient advocates, scientists, and politicians for pediatric neurological conditions, but also other chronic diseases. So. Um, first, a few quick acknowledgments. Um, oh, yep. Got to click on that one, too. All right. So um, first, to Mr. Siegel and Mr. Fernandez, um, I'm so glad that they were able to bring us all together, and I'm so thankful that I was able to come and share my presentation with you all. And also to Dr. Schneider and Dr. Kurtzberg, um, it's such a great privilege to be able to speak on a panel um, with such outstanding researchers and physicians. And I hope to bring a complementary perspective to the science that you guys are going to talk about. So, first, um, what is a patient advocate? And I'll be really quick, or you can basically just read it off the slide that they give a voice to patients on things that are in the public health. So they bring attention to health professionals and they bring attention to pharmaceutical companies and everything in between. So um, the key really is that advocates can be anyone who's willing to help make this cause their cause. So you know this includes people who lobby Congress for stem cell research. This includes the families of patients. And it even includes people at this conference, including, for example, uh, Mr. Reed, who published an entire book and worked so hard to make stem cell research possible, or Bob Klein of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, who worked hard to bring Proposition 71, which is one of the biggest sources of funding for stem cell research, uh, into the public eye in California and really push that legislation through. So some background on to why I'm a patient advocate. Um, I'm a freshman at Duke, but the reason why I'm standing in front of you today starts with my brother Jacob who in 2008 had a really severe uh, traumatic brain injury uh, in a hayride. Um, he's actually sitting right in the audience, and um, unfortunately he is quadriplegic right now, and he doesn't have sight or communication. And so afterwards, um, you know, it was a har harrowing experience for my family. We were, as it says, in kind of a state of limbo, and uh, it's even more unimaginable for Jacob 
But the key term there really is that, you know, a lot of the time we say that it's unimaginable. And, you know, in order for me to feel that I could take care of Jacob long term, I felt that I needed to live in his shoes. So for 24 hours, I did live in his shoes. Um, I did what he did. I wore what he wore. I ate the mashed up food that he ate. And I sat in his wheelchair without moving, without seeing, um, without talking. And, you know, it really was a startling human experience where I realized that Jacob was really dependent on all of us, his caregivers and his advocates, for nearly everything that happened. But he's not the only one who's dependent. Nearly everyone who suffers from a chronic disease is really dependent on their caregivers, their advocates, to not only be there for the minute necessities that are, you know, out there, but really to care for them, to give them hope and guidance, and to show them that there are going to be cures or that we're working towards cures to really encourage them in that aspect. So to sort of continue on to why can, you know, this advocacy is important, or why it's important to adopt the mindset of a patient advocate. Um, fast forward to March of this year, a really close friend of mine, Christine, from my high school, suffered a really serious brain aneurysm, and she was just a few months away from heading to Georgetown, so she's my age, and suddenly had this really major obstacle in her life where um, she's paralyzed on the right side of her body, and she suffers from a lot of problems with memory, with cognition, and she's really trying to pick up the pieces right now. And, you know, she's a fighter, but the thing is that it was another visceral human connection. And, you know, what I realized is that when you go in there and see this person who is previously so happy, you know, that kind of spark that's lost in her eyes after you go there, you realize, like, why patient advocacy is so important, why it's so important to stand up for these people, because it's just an, a complete change in who she was. And so, you know, after my experience with Jacob, I understood a lot better. I saw what happened in my family happen in their family, and that sort of gave me the strength to become more of a patient advocate. So, you know, when I visited the hospital each week, you noticed that her parents, despite the fact that they cared for her immensely and loved her a lot, were so caught up with the day-to-day -day things that, you know, she needed, like what was she going to eat or where was she going to go for, you know, this therapy or that therapy, that they weren't able to look into the things that are in the long term. So, you know, the key takeaways from being a patient advocate is the first thing is that, again, it's in the long term. So, you know, we see that the patients are really, go you know, they need people to be with them for a time, even after the injury, even after the diagnosis of chronic disease, they're going to need people to stay with them in the long term. And so, you know, it's even simple things that can make this happen. So for me, you know, with Christine, what we saw was that if we just collaborated with her parents and, you know, what I did was kind of create a calendar with her friends and put those two things together, you know, we saw a wave of resurgence, a wave of people coming back in to support her, even after she was dealing with things like depression later on after the injury. So, you know, that's the first thing. And then another thing is that we really have to connect the human element with the scientific element. The work that Dr. Schneider and Dr. Kurtzberg are doing is so important. And, you know, when you see the humans, like Dr. Schneider mentioned, who are really impacted by what goes on, that's when, you know, this patient advocacy really comes into its prime. And, you know, finally, again, the logistical difficulties that happened there. So the important thing that, you know, I noticed here was that it was easy to leverage small connections to become a patient advocate. I shadow with a neurosurgeon back home, and, you know, when Christine's parents expressed that they were disappointed about one of these surgeons, it was really easy to speak with the neurosurgeon that I knew and say, hey, you know, can we connect them with someone that you know? So that's an easy way to get involved in patient advocacy. Um, and then... Oh, yeah. More holistically, um, in terms of advocacy, something that I started with Alex Richmond of the Pediatric Brain Foundation, along with two of my co-researchers, Nikhil and Dominic, who really helped with a lot of uh, data cleaning and um, paper editing for a paper based on a survey that we did um, with 235 individuals, where we really focused on the awareness and advocacy for various pediatric neurological conditions in sort of a case study format. Um, and so what we really looked at was what uh, yep, is, you know, our results kind of showed that those who knew someone with a PNC with these conditions 
and who are more exposed were more confident about their knowledge in PNCs, and we found a statistically significant difference at the 5% level. And then, you know, we kind of thought that that was a ripple effect, where if you were more confident about your knowledge after being exposed, you ended up actually being able to go out and say, hey, look, this is my friend who has this story, and then hand it to the person who doesn't know anything. This is the World Stem Cell Summit flyer, and this is somewhere where we're looking into cures for these types of diseases. And then we also found, to kind of piggyback on that, that those people who knew someone with a PNC, or in other words, were more exposed, were also more likely to be an advocate. And we found statistical significance um, between the two subgroups at a 10% level. So we basically find that when you're more exposed, you're more, um, more willing to go out and be an advocate like that. So how can you advocate as people who are here at the summit? So just by being here and working with patients, by making your research and the things that you do public and always being ready to stand up for the cause, you're already 50% of the way there. But you know, the next step is that we can do more. So we need to inform families and the general public you know, how far would we be towards advancing the cause if the main voting issue that was in the next election was the chronic diseases that affect 45% of Americans in the United States, whether it's HIV, whether it's TBI, whether it's juvenile diabetes, whether these chronic diseases that, you know, we are patient advocates for was the big voting issue, we would see a lot more research, a lot more work done. And that kind of steps into the next point, which is that we need to nudge and maybe even push politicians. This kind of links back into you know, what I was talking about with Mr. Reed, where when he wanted to have a lot of work done, he sent out individual emails to tons of politicians. The thing is, these politicians really need to understand that we as the constituents, we as the taxpayers, are interested in this type of research, we're interested in these types of cures, and this is what we want to stand for. And in the end, the politicians need to know that these types of cures are not only going to help the patients, and the families, but also come back and benefit the taxpayers. And finally, we'd hope to you know, go through initiatives that really catalyze support for the research that we're doing. So you know, a great example is the Pediatric Brain Foundation's Brain Mapping Project, which Alex Richmond, who I mentioned before, actually started. And his brother Palmer actually suffered for a long time with an undiagnosed neurological disease. And so the importance of something like a brain mapping project is that if Palmer and his family could go online and see, look, this is where other people who don't, you know, who have an undiagnosed condition and have these symptoms are, that's where they can find a support network, that's where they can join up for clinical trials and continue to make this advocacy network larger and continue the science. So that's basically the uh, end of my presentation and I sort of finished with just a quote from um, Bernard Siegel who is really, you know, was really an important person in you know, a lot, getting a lot of the stem cell research that's out there today to be done. And he says that we're trying to turn on the light and the only way we're going to do this is by working together. So in the end, you know, patients, politicians, doctors, researchers, we all need to work together to have advocacy done. Thank you. Well, so you all know me, I think, and my slides are up. And I'm going to go quickly because some of this I've shown in other talks in the meeting. But I'm involved in a program using cord blood um, to really do clinical work and clinical trials to hopefully expand its um, use in the clinic to uh, the field of regenerative medicine. And very quickly, the cord blood story started in 1988 when a little boy with Fanconi anemia had a transplant from his baby sister's cord blood and um, it was successful. He's shown here 27 years later, still fully engrafted with his sister's cord blood, alive and well. And he really, as a patient, paved the way for the whole field. And this was a first in man experiment in a child in the day was when regulations were kind of different, but really without that transplant, I don't think I'd be standing here today. Um, the cord blood field has advanced there have been 35,000 unrelated donor, oh, <laughs> unrelated donor cord blood transplants in the world. Uh, most of them have been in patients with uh, hemologic malignancies or bone marrow diseases or immune deficiency or hemoglobinopathies or inborn errors in metabolism. But they've shown that this is a viable source of blood stem cells that can reconstitute hematopoiesis. There are also many unrelated donor banks and private banks around the world, and the unrelated inventory is estimated to be around 700,000 units, and the private inventory is estimated to be more than 4 million units. 
Um, so this is a robust uh, uh, inventory of cord blood units to work with to provide therapy to patients. In our own work at Duke, and Evan alluded to this, we've spent many years using cord blood as a source of cells to reconstitute hematopoiesis in children with inborn errors of metabolism um, to correct their deficiency. And through that work, we've treated children with the diseases on the slide, and we've shown that when we permanently implant or um, engraft hematopoietic cells from a healthy donor, we can correct the disease halt progression, and essentially replace missing factors and enzymes through the normal allogeneic cells. We've also shown that earlier is better, alluding to Evan's point, um, when we get these kids pre-symptomatically or early in the course of disease, either because they have a family history or through newborn screening, which is emerging now for many of these conditions, we can um, essentially uh, guarantee survival in somewhere between 80 and 90% of patients with good function. But if we get these children late because the family doesn't know and they present with symptoms, then survival is poor and the function of the children surviving is poor. Um, we took the work that, um, and observations that we made working with children with these inborn errors undergoing myeloablative transplant or transplant after high dose chemotherapy depending on cell engraftment. And we showed in collaboration with Evan that cells given in the blood to these children over time and graft in the brain. So this is a brain section of a little girl who had Crabbe disease and who unfortunately died 10 months post-transplant. But um, Evan studied this brain in his laboratory and showed that male donor cells were scattered throughout this child's brain 10 months post-transplant. And um, I'll come back to that later. But harnessing that power, we postulated that um, if in allogeneic transplantation, cells engraft in the brain and change the course of neurologic disease, perhaps in brain injuries, um, we could use a child's own cells to mediate or modulate the course of the injury. And in that therapy, we would not be depending on the cells to engraft. We would not be giving high-dose chemotherapy. We would be using the cells as signaling vehicles to induce the body to repair. Um, so we have embarked on studies in children with autologous and now allogeneic cord blood with autism, a hypoxic for, uh, injury at birth, cerebral palsy, and adults with stroke. And I'm just going to show you a few um, sort of tantalizing results that we have from these studies. So in autism, we've conducted a phase one endpoint finding safety study in 25 children. Um, we're just completing one year follow-up. Uh, they all, they were between ages two and six, all had to have classic uh, ASD, and they could not have a genetic cause for the autism. They had to have a qualifying autologous cord blood that their parents, probably not because they knew their child would have autism, but just because they elected to bank their child's cord blood in a private bank, um, had available. And the kids were studied with multiple testing, uh, treated with an autologous cord blood infusion. This is open label, phase one, followed up at six months, and followed up at 12 months. Um, the therapy was safe and well tolerated. It was done in the clinic it, with, through a peripheral IV after standard premedication, and um, there were no major adverse events. Um, and as we analyze this data, and I'm just showing you one slide, we're seeing that there was a reduction in the autistic symptoms in these children. In, a, um, in children who were not speaking, some developed the ability to use words. There was an increased amount of vocalization, even at the six-month endpoint. And I can't really explain why this is happening, um, but it's looking exciting and um, encouraging. And for that reason, we are now going to take this into a standard, randomized, blinded phase two trial where children will be treated um, with a cord blood and its best donor if they're qualified. And they will be randomized to get placebo and or cord blood. And in the cord blood section, if they have their own, they'll get it. And if not, they'll get it. A sibling or an unrelated cord blood, and they'll come back at six months and cross over, get a di the infusion of the opposite product, and they'll be analyzed at all points along the way. And we have developed what we believe are uh, uh, non-biased, objective, 
uh, endpoints that we can assess both with neurophysiologic testing, neuroimaging, and neuropsychologic testing. So maybe next year I can give you some follow-up on that. In our studies with kids with a hypoxic injury at birth or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, these are term babies with a hypoxic insult around the time of birth with a high mortality who are now standardly cooled as part of their therapy. We showed that giving their own cells is safe and also appears to have some efficacy. So these are babies born um, with hypoxic injury. Their cord blood is collected by the OB delivering them. They're cooled per standard of care, and if their parents agree, they participate in the study and get an infusion of their own cord blood days one and two of life. And um, this was published in JPEDS last year, but basically compared to a concomitantly treated control group of babies who got cooling alone without cells, the babies who got cooling with cells uh, had better survival with normal function at a year of, of age. And this, again, is enough for us to take this into phase two, and we're about to open a multi-center trial uh, funded by the Robertson Foundation where kids will be randomized to get their cord blood mononuclear cells or cord blood red cells, and it'll be blinded and we'll look at outcomes at a year. So these are in progress early phase trials. And um, we've just finished a randomized placebo controlled blinded crossover study in children with cerebral palsy getting autologous cord blood. And again, this was a, all of these studies are under IND. It was for kids ages one to six with spastic CP who had ineligible cord blood and moderate to severe uh, cerebral palsy. We define the endpoints using a motor scale called the gross motor function scale, um, which is a well-validated measure for scoring motor function in kids with CP. Um, and the cord blood was, again, autologous and administered IV uh, through a peripheral IV in the clinic. So kids were qualified, cord blood was qualified, they came to Duke, they got evaluated, they were randomized, they either received their cord blood or an infusion of a placebo, which was tissue culture media with DMSO, and um, got um, sent home, came back at a year, were reevaluated and crossed over. And the end point was at this first year post-treatment to see if there was a difference between the placebo and the um, treated children. Um, it sounds trivial, but we actually had to establish qualifications for the cord blood units because they came from many banks around the world, and we developed a minimal cell count, uh, required sterility, required donor screening tests, and um, confirmed identity with HLA typing on the child. Um, this is the take-home message from the study. I presented it in more detail earlier today, but basically here's the placebo group, and then here are the kids getting a low cell dose, or a, in green, or a high, higher cell dose in red. And in the high cell dose group, which is more than 25 million cells per kilo, which is the standard threshold we use for allogeneic transplantation, we saw a response with improved motor function. Um, and so we're pursuing this and using that dose threshold in our subsequent studies. Now that has implications for private banking because it means that not every unit that's small is gonna be useful in these types of therapies. And every private banker and every public banker needs to encourage every obstetrician who may collect cord blood to get as much as they possibly can because it may matter later. Um, this is MRIs in these kids. This is called connectivity analysis. Red means more connections. Blue means less connections. The three kids in the top were in the positive response group, got high cell doses, had a uh, GMFM score that increased more than predicted, and you can see that there are a lot of increased fibers. The kids in the bottom had no change in the GMFM score and did not have increased fibers. So this is a bioassay, if you will, that we can also use that's very objective. And it confirms that one of the ways these kids are getting better is by building new connections in the brain. Um, these are videos of one representative child just to show you what I mean by a positive change. So the top one is the child at study entry. So you can see he's walking with a walker. He's a GMF CS level three. Um, he has braces. He can't walk on his own. Um, and one year later, you can see him um, walking independently. He's able to go over the bar um, on his own. Um, 
and he's really had significant increase in, or improvement in function. And that's well beyond what would have been predicted by the normal development of a kid with cerebral palsy with that type of insult. And I'm just showing you one anecdotal example. Um, we also have an interest in using cells that we're, we're manufacturing from cord blood um, as a therapy um, in the brain. And um, as you, I showed this slide before in the little inset, but this is the child's brain with Crabbe with engraftment of uh, donor cells, so female brain, male donor, uh, 10 months post-transplant. And these are two brothers with Crabbe just showing you the difference between transplanting as a a neonate, this is kid was transplanted at three weeks of age and transplanting at a year. So the kid transplanted at a year has severe motor impairment that did not get corrected by the transplant, but the kid at three months, uh, three weeks, sorry, um, you know, had prevention of the development of that problem from the transplant. Again, emphasizing time, but one of the things I want to do in my life is figure out a way to either prevent this child kind of condition from happening or be able to intervene even when a child already is impaired. Um, so we took that observation of the cells we saw in that child's brain back to our laboratory and said maybe we can grow those cells and develop them as a cellular product. And we did. It's called the Duke O-cell number one, or version one, <laughs> D-U-O-C. Um, and we took the hypothesis we made in the clinic, back to the laboratory, figured out how to manufacture that cell, or I think that cell, which is a microglial kind of cell, um, and developed protocols in a GMP uh, a, a venue to um, produce a cell product. It takes us 21 days to grow these from a standard cord blood that's been cryopreserved and thawed. We have an IND to take this into a clinical trial. I'll show you a little bit of the work we did to characterize the cell. And long story short, it's now in a clinical trial for intrathecal administration or in the spinal fluid administration, uh, augmenting a standard cord blood transplant. We had to show that the cells made all the enzymes that we were gonna correct in these lysosomal storage disorders. Sounds trivial because we were using normal donors, but we still had to show that our manufacturing didn't alter the cell's ability to do that. And this slide shows five lots and all the enzymes that we measure and the production was normal. We examined which cytokines these cells made and they make IL-6 and IL-10. Um, in large amounts, both constitutively and then with stimulation. IL-10 is anti-inflammatory. We consider that a positive uh, phenotype. And then IL-6 can be proneurogenic, and it can be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, but in our animal models, it was anti-inflammatory. Um, Andy Balber in the last talk showed that we developed a model of feeding mice cuprazone, which demyelinates the corpus callosum, and then we could look at whether injection of these cells facilitated remyelination. So here's, these are stacked tiled sections of whole brain of mice. Green is the myelin basic protein staining, which stains myelin. This is a normal mouse brain. This is a mouse fed cuprazone for f uh, five weeks. This is a mouse fed cuprazone for five weeks and rescued with normal saline, which is the control. And this is a mouse fed cuprazone and then rescued with injection intracranially of the DUOC cells. And you can see that there's robust myelination returning. This is uh, EM level uh, portrayal of the same uh, data. So this is the uh, cuprazone fed mouse and this is the cuprazone fed mouse rescued with DUOC and you can see nice uh, myelination around the axons. So this cell is not replacing, it's not integrating, but it's promoting myelination. And basically um, we feel like it, it's going to work through several mechanisms. It can replace enzymes, it can clean up debris and uh, abnormal substrates that build up in the absence of these enzymes. It secretes valuable cytokines and it promotes myelination. And so we have a clinical trial now where um, we are taking children with lysosomal storage disorders and some evidence of uh, brain, you know, cortical spinal tract involvement and we're taking a standard cord blood unit which in most banks is um, stored in a two compartment bag and we're using the big compartment to transplant the baby with a standard myeloablative systemic transplant. One week later, we take the small compartment, we establish it and manufacture DUOC cells, which takes, again, 21 days in the GMP laboratory, so that at 28 days, we give that baby, who's now engrafted with the same donor, 
and doesn't have graft-versus-host disease, an intrathecal injection of the DUOC cells with the hope that these cells will then get to the brain more quickly, uh, bridge the gap between when the systemic cells get to the brain and when the brain needs help, and at the end of the day, the child will be permanently engrafted with donor cells in the brain, probably from the initial systemic transplant, but augmented with these extra cells. Now, we're doing this in this fashion because the FDA wanted us to be in a, using cells in a recipient that was already tolerated or tolerized to that donor. Um, but we're hoping, as we go forward, that if these cells prove safe, we can use them as an intervention without chemotherapy and without a standard transplant in many other demyelinating diseases. And because it's very active in the Cooper zone model, which is a model of MS, we're thinking that we may go into adult MS as the first trial of using it as a single source of therapy. Um, up to now, we've treated, we have seven patients enrolled on this trial. Five have been treated. Two are in the in-between stage where they've gotten the systemic transplant and their cell are being manufactured for intrathecal use. So, and so far, I have to say knock on wood, we haven't seen any adverse events with the intrathecal administration and it's way too soon to know if there's any, um, any efficacy uh, with this added therapy. Um, finally, um, because we know that these autologous cells in CP and HIE and maybe autism are showing signals. Um, we want to be able to broaden the concept that cord blood therapy is autologous and really take it into the allogeneic realm so that all patients in need could have access to this therapy. Um, and to do that, we first had to show safety in an adult situation, and so we have initiated an adult stroke trial. I'll describe that in a minute. And we also have now initiated a sibling trial in children with cerebral palsy. Both of these are safety dose-finding um, trials, but we plan to take them into phase two as well. Um, if we can show that the um, allogeneic study is safe in adults, we've already shown through autologous therapy that we have an expectation of benefit in children. So we hope to be able to go into the best donor setting, getting either autologous or sibling or unrelated donor cells. Um, so our ischemic stroke trial, stroke trial is for adults with uh, acute ischemic stroke three to 10 days post-stroke, and they're getting an off-the-shelf, un-HLA matched or not HLA matched, um, publicly banked cord blood unit that's dosed by, uh, for size and also for ABO matching, just so we don't have blood type incompatibilities. The units are all washed and they're given IV, and um, the patients are being followed for the usual endpoints for toxicity, as well as uh, descriptive endpoints for efficacy. And um, we based this work on data we, or experiments we did in mice where we induced an MCAO stroke and then gave human cord blood or placebo, and we're able to show that in the mice, five days was the optimal time of treatment and that we can impact survival as well as infarct size and function. Um, and that was enough for us to get the IND to go ahead with the other trial. We treated um, five patients to date and um, fortunately have not seen any infusion role issues or toxicity, and we have a long way to go before we get into phase two, but our plan is to roll over to a phase two randomized trial using placebo versus actual cord blood. And if this is effective, again, it's a relatively simple therapy that could be administered not without manipulation um, to, and quickly made available to patients who have an acute stroke. So I've showed you that you know we've completed autologous studies with safety in kids with brain injury, uh, phase one and two in kids with CP, phase one in newborns with HIE, phase one in older children with autism, and we are um, we have an ongoing study I didn't mention in babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and then we're planning a phase two in children with autism uh, using um, both allogeneic and autologous cells, and then on the allogeneic side, phase two in children with CP. Um, phase two in adults with uh, ischemic stroke and um, perhaps one with children with stroke. So we have a big program focused on brain injury and the potential of cord blood to provide benefit. So in summary, I like to say the cord blood journey is 27 years young um, and that we're just really starting on a pathway to appreciate not only its role in restoring hematopoiesis 
in myeloablative transplantation, but its role in regenerative medicine. Banking practices have matured around the world and inventories are large and much more qualified than they used to be and available for allogeneic therapy. Cord blood increases access to uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant for patients who lack a matched donor, but early results using cord blood and brain injury are very promising, and I think cord blood has enormous potential for use in therapy, cellular therapies and regenerative medicine. And I'll just stop there and acknowledge the hundreds of people in my team um, without which or I could never be standing here telling you about our work, and many of them have been with me over two decades and are very dedicated to this whole process. These are three kids we took with us to an FDA here panel that Evan, actually Evan chaired, um, which was the hearing to um, grant licensure to the first public bank in the US, which was the New York Blood Center. But this little girl, they all spoke, and this little girl had crab A and was transplanted at 19 days of age with an unrelated cord blood unit. This little girl has Hurler syndrome and was transplanted at a year, which is in the eighth grade in this picture. I'm actually going to college next year, and this little boy has adrenal leuk dystrophy and was transplanted when he was two and a half. And um, they all testified, and I think helped the FDA realize that there were many applications for allogeneic cord blood. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much. Even though we're running a little late, I think we, I don't think there's anything else in this room, so we can take a few minutes for questions and things of that sort. Sure, any of the speakers. Yeah. So I have a question for Dr. Kurtzberg. I have about 50 questions, so I'll just try to do my favorite one. Yeah, we'll <laughs> all be here for the rest of the night. Yeah, I have to make day, a so. plane so I can't do 50. You yeah, can do I'll, 2. I'll try to do 50. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with the favorite one. So when you talk about the patient's history, you're talking about the patient's history, and 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 you're Oh, God, that's a really hard question, and um, it's hard to answer. I, I think there are many causes of autism. I want to emphasize, and I didn't say it, but in our study, we excluded children who had, were known to have a genetic cause for autism. Um, I think that some of autism may be mediated by inflammatory processes or autoimmune processes, perhaps alloimmune-directed processes from the mother to the child. And in that case, I think the cells have a way of mediating um, or, or you know, modulating inflammation. I also think autism, for whatever reason, has major connectivity uh, issues in the brain. Some kids have increased connectivity, some have decreased, but they all have aberrant connectivity. And for why that is caused, I don't know, but I think the cells are able to instruct the brain to build new connections. And I'll also mention that all the kids in our studies were getting other intensive supportive therapies as part of their normal routines, and perhaps the cells facilitated their ability to respond to those therapies. But I don't really know. That's all conjecture. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Just talk real loud because we don't have a mic down there. Okay, I'll do that. Good. She can do that. Well, I think that um, with all cell therapies, that they can't just be administered in an oncology center. And as an example, in our HIE trial, we're enabling each nursery to have the equipment to volume reduce the cells and create a cell dose. In our stroke trial, uh, Biosafe, which is a company that makes a, a device that washes cord blood, has provided these devices to the center so that the stroke unit can actually prepare the cord blood unit. But I think that there is going to have to be a big labor force training uh, uh, exercise in order to ready centers to respond. And for the acute diseases, that there isn't going to be time for a referral to uh, you know, a tertiary medical center. So it's going to have to be exported. But it's a little early for that right now. We still have to prove it works. <laughs> yeah. Other? Yeah. You're welcome. All right. 
I can attest to that. I, I was chairman of the FDA committee where <laughs> Joanne uh, kind of marched her entire army <laughs> in front of us. We, 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 we couldn't say no. <laughs> and her dedication is, is, is astounding. Yeah, Don. Uh, Davis, I was just watching you outside when you were talking to somebody you obviously never seen before, and you gave them the 30 second pitch, and uh, you guys swapped cards. So I, I can see this is a very, you have a long career ahead of you. I wonder, are you thinking about trying for a Jacob's Law to try and raise funds, building around him as a, for, as a possibility for uh, brain or spine injury? Yeah, so, um, well, my mom has been doing a lot of work uh, into looking into the potential clinical trials and um, therapies in New Jersey. Um, we haven't looked as much into the legislative aspect as well. In fact, that's something that I really learned from coming to this, to this conference, and that's something that's so great about being here, is that I learned about, a lot about the power of you know, advocating to the legislature itself. So I think that's something that we're definitely going to be exploring um, whether something like that can be you know, uh, done. And there's already a few stem cell uh, centers that you know, do things with TBI, for example, at Rutgers. Um, they're doing some good work there, and there's also uh, something I kind of um, was just interning with a few years ago where they're doing stuff um, actually comparing the neuronal stem cells of children who have autism and children who don't. So, it would be really interesting to see whether we can push as advocates to get for more, more funding for things like that. Yeah. You had another question? I'll, I'll ask one. So when Dr. Kirkford, in your mouse study of stroke, um, was that in the autologous or the LMA? No, that was xenodonaic. So that was taking immunocompetent mice, mm -hmm. inducing a stroke, and then giving them human cord Human cord blood. Human wow. cord blood. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I have one scientific question. It sounds like the, the cell of action within, you're focusing in, is the microglial cell. Is that, am I getting well, that correct? Well, if you ask Andy Balber, who works with me, he's, he thinks it's the CD14 cell, which could be a precursor of a microglial yeah. cell. Because I think the microglial cell is starting to be, it, it, They're very it's like what the astrocyte yeah. used to be. People right. now are starting to recognize, it's yeah. the Rodney Dangerfield cell right. that microglia, yeah. Never used to get any respect, but yeah, the microglial they're, they're, cells they're are, very are, important cells. are exceedingly important, both yeah. as therapies for disease and causes of right. disease. So actually. in autism, also, the microglial cell is abnormal. Um, so that's just an aside. Okay. Any other questions? Well, great. Thanks so much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, very nice.